Hi everyone and welcome to the chapter 3 lecture for medical terminology. This chapter is all about gastroenterology or the study of the stomach and intestines. Really the digestive system or what we also can call the gastrointestinal system. So this system and this chapter is one of the longest ones I think because there's so many different parts to the gastrointestinal system. So there's a lot of organs, a lot of medical terms, a lot of diseases that we're gonna cover. Um, so give yourself time to study these. So the gastrointestinal system starts at the mouth, goes down the esophagus into the stomach, through the small intestine, then the large intestine, and out the anus. Um, and some of these organs are very long and have multiple sections that we'll talk about. There's also some accessory organs, things like the liver and the gallbladder, which you can see here, and the pancreas, which you can't see here. Um, some common sort of themes um, or patterns of this body system is that each of these organs, separate organs, is separated. They're all connected, but they're separated by sphincters, which are ring-shaped muscles that open and close. So the default position is closed, and then when food needs to move from one part to the other, they open and allow stuff in and close. So it keeps things from flowing backwards. The purpose of the gastrointestinal system is to digest your food, absorb the nutrients from that digested food, and eliminate any waste, anything that doesn't get digested and absorbed. So sort of three parts. So I like to open up each of these chapters, these sort of anatomy physiology chapters with a term of the day, with some medical term that's not found in the book, um, just partly to uh, show you that even though we're learning a ton of medical terms, we're not learning all of the medical terms that there are in existence out there. There's others. And also because a lot of them are fun, um, ones that are just fun and funny to know that make me laugh anyway. So my term of the day for the gastrointestinal system is postprandial somnolence. By the way, terms of the day are fair game for tests. So postprandial means pertaining to after a meal. So post is after, al is uh, pertaining to, and prando means a meal. And somnolence is a fancy term for sleepy. So when you eat a big meal like Thanksgiving or you have a big feast and then afterwards you get a food coma, this is basically the medical word for a food coma, postprandial somnolence. So if you want to like impress or irritate everyone um, after your next big meal, instead of complaining about a food coma, complain about postprandial somnolence. My other word of the day, because I couldn't decide between these two, is borborygmus. And I think this one is in the textbook in one of the like exercises in the chapter. Um, but this is a term that refers to the sound that your stomach makes, that gurgling sound is called borborygmus. And it's a, an automatopoeia, which um, means it's a word that sounds like the sound it is. So like my, the classic example of onomatopoeia is clippity-clop, clippity-clop, which is the sound that horse hooves make. So borborygmus, I guess the ancient Greeks thought that that gurgling of the stomach sounded like borborygmus, and so that's what they call it. Um, so that's an actual medical term, borborygmus, and when um, a nurse or a physician or someone is doing auscultation using their stethoscope to listen for intestinal sounds. That's what they're listening for. They're listening for borborygmus, the intestine, sound of intestinal movement. All right, so here's another view of the GI system as a whole, sometimes also called the digestive system. So you'll see it has a lot of sort of synonyms. Um, starts in the mouth. There's uh, salivary glands in the mouth, the tongue, the throat, food, when you swallow food, it goes down the throat, um, which we call the pharynx. And then it goes down this long tube called the esophagus into the stomach. From the stomach, it then feeds into the small intestine, which is this uh, pinkish orange long 
coiled mess in here. From the small intestine, it goes into the large intestine, whoops, which is this large, almost square shaped tube. And then finally comes out the anus. Any undigested stuff comes out the anus. So we're going to talk about all these parts and all of the accessory organs as well, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. So starting in the mouth, um, some of the things to know are, about, are the salivary glands. The names of the salivary glands use medical terminology. So there's three pairs of salivary glands. Um, you have the parotid glands, which are here. And parotid literally means next to the ear. Para is beside, and oto is ear. So the parotid glands are located next to the ear. And then you have two that are sort of in the bottom of your mouth. There's one directly under your tongue, so it's called the sublingual gland. Sub means below. Linguo means tongue. Um, linguistics, the study of languages. Sometimes people will say, um, talk about languages as have you know having many tongues, many languages. So linguo can mean language or tongue. Um, and then the other one here is the submandibular gland or glands, and they are really like right alongside the jaw, so right under the lower jaw, which is called the mandible. So submandibular. So this is not uncommon in anatomy for organs or bones or body parts or blood vessels, whatever, to be named based on a location. Um, and so in the case of the salivary glands, their names reflect their location in the face. So when you take a bite of food, um, you will secrete saliva, which will help moisten it and help you to break it down, make it easier to swallow. You also will chew it, which is a form of mechanical digestion. You're physically breaking the food into smaller pieces. And the fancy word for chewing, by the way, is mastication. It'll come up later in the lecture. Then you swallow the food. And the fancy medical word for swallowing is deglutition. So when you swallow, I just think that swallowing is a really cool part of physiology. Um, so I always like to talk about it. So the throat is called the pharynx. So here's your mouth. The tongue comes up to the roof of the mouth and food slides to the back into the pharynx, the throat down here. And then there's this flap of tissue right here called the epiglottis. And it's just this tiny flap of tissue, but it has such an important and critical role. And its job is to basically keep you from um, breathing in your food or for the food go, going down the wrong way. So there's two tubes here in your neck. You've got the, the tube that leads to the esophagus back here. And then you have the tube in front, which is the trachea, the, the windpipe that leads to the lungs. And of course, you want food to go down the backside. And so what the, esoph what the epiglottis does when you swallow food, the food sort of catches on this edge here and pushes the epiglottis down. So it ends up doing like this and it simultaneously closes the trachea so food doesn't go down in your windpipe and serves as sort of a slide for food to go down the esophagus to your stomach. It's why when you're swallowing you can't breathe. If you ever like you know try to swallow hold your nose and swallow a bunch of times you lose your breath because you can't actually breathe while you're swallowing because your windpipe is closed. Um, when you choke on something, it's uh, like usually because a bolus, a big piece of food has gotten stuck here and your epiglottis is stuck in the closed position and so you can't breathe and the, the sort of um, treatment for that, of course, is the Heimlich maneuver, which is an attempt to forcefully push air out of the lung in the hopes that it will fling, cause the epiglottis to fling that piece of food back out of your mouth. Um, so the epiglottis has so much, so much importance in eating and swallowing and choking. 
All right. Also, another thing about it, if you are like talking or laughing while you're eating and swallowing, that can cause the epiglottis to flap open a little bit, which is how you sometimes swallow food the wrong, wrong way or drink the wrong way. And then you start choking because, and choking, coughing, I shouldn't say choking, you start coughing when that happens. Um, and the coughing is air from your lungs trying to push out any fluid or food that might have tried to slip down the trachea because you don't want that stuff getting into your lungs. It can just cause infections. Um, okay, so that is um, about the epiglottis. The larynx is not actually part of the um, of the GI system, but it is this top part above the trachea. This so the larynx. Three things to keep track of: the larynx, commonly known as the voice box; the pharynx is what is commonly known as the throat; and the trachea is what we commonly refer to as the windpipe. So those are three terms or three pieces of anatomy that people constantly confuse. So make, maybe star those, make sure you keep those straight. All right, so after food goes down or goes past the pharynx, goes down into the esophagus, the esophagus is just a long tube whose job is to carry food to the stomach, past the lungs and the heart. There's like a whole bunch of stuff in the chest that is not part of the gastrointestinal system. So it's just like a highway, a food highway, um, the esophagus is. And um, it moves food through a process of muscle contractions that are like wave-like contractions that move the food down. And those wave-like contractions are called peristalsis. Peristalsis is the word for those wave-like contractions that actually occur throughout the gastrointestinal system, starting in the esophagus all the way down to the anus. Not in your mouth, though. There's no peristalsis in your mouth. That would be weird. Have like mouth spasms. Um, but it's also why you can actually eat and drink standing upside down. So it's not that food goes down to your stomach because of gravity. It's why you can do things like a keg stand, because even if you're upside down, you swallow, the um, peristalsis will still move food towards your stomach, even if you're opposite of gravity. Fun facts for you, All right? At the start and end, but really at the end of the esophagus, there is a sphincter, and it is um, to separate the stomach and the esophagus, more to protect the esophagus from the contents of the stomach. So the sphincter opens up to let food into the stomach, and then it closes so that stomach acid and all of the toxic uh, corrosive contents of the stomach don't get back up into the esophagus. We'll talk about what that, that disease is. Um, so the stomach is actually a fairly large or organ. Its purpose is really as a storage tank. Um, it sort of grind, it, it mashes the food and kind of gets it a little bit more broken up, but there's not a lot of chemical digestion that goes on in the stomach. It's more of a holding tank, and then a lot of digestion occurs in the small intestine. So the stomach, in order to help prepare the food for digestion in the small intestine, is full of acid and, um, and digestive enzymes that break down proteins. There's some good protein digestion happening there. And that those enzymes and acids can actually damage tissues as well. And so the stomach protects itself from its own contents um, by producing a, a protective mucus. So the inner lining of the stomach has is called the gastric mucosa. And it's a, a lining of tissue that produces mucus that protects the stomach from all the stomach acid actually eroding away the stomach. Um, since the stomach's job is as a storage tank, it also has these sort of folds and wrinkles that allow it to expand when it's full and then contract back when it's empty. Those folds are called the rugi, or rugi actually is how you say it. Um, either is acceptable. Um, 
The stomach is also divided into different sections, four sections, because it's fairly large. So the, the opening um, here, the first part of the stomach, which is actually very near the heart, uh, where the heart is located in the chest, is called the cardia of the stomach. Cardio is heart. So the cardia of the stomach is near the heart. The top part of the stomach here, this dome-shaped part, is called a fundus. We'll, le we'll learn that a lot of organs have a dome-shaped part that's called a fundus. So fundus just means like dome. Um, the bulk of the stomach here is known as the body. And then the last section of the stomach is called the pylorus. And so this sphincter here that separates the stomach and the small intestine is called the pyloric sphincter. So there's a sphincter at the beginning and at the end of the stomach. The one at the beginning is just usually called the gastroesophageal sphincter, meaning it's the sphincter between the stomach and the esophagus, which makes sense. It can also be called the lower esophageal sphincter. So this is just a note about really spelling and grammar in medical terminology. So we say that the gastric mucosa is a mucous membrane. And what it produces is mucus. But those two words, mucus and mucus, are spelled differently. So when we spell mucus with O-U-S, O-U-S is a suffix that means pertaining to. So this one means pertaining to mucus. It's a membrane that pertains to mucus. In this case, mucus is an adjective that's describing the type of membrane. But when we spell it U-S, U-S ending is a noun. It um, doesn't really have a specific definition. It's just a thing. It designates the word as a noun. So like cephalo means head. But cephalus means like the head, the head, like you're talking about the head. The head is called the cephalus. Um, I don't know if that made any sense. But my mnemonic for this little spelling distinction, which can come into play on spelling quizzes, is a Harry Potter reference. Because if I didn't already tell you, I'm a fan of Harry Potter. And this character in the center here is named Sirius Black. And he happens to have a very serious expression on his face. And I thought that was a good example of how two words spelled slightly differently. Serious black with just I-U-S. That's a noun. That's the person. And the serious expression he has is an adjective, and it's spelled O-U-S. So on when you have uh, the word mucus as a spelling word, pay attention to which one is the spelling word because they are different words that have different spellings. They do have different um, uh, like grammatical meaning. All right, so back to the digestive system. We are in the stomach. We talked about the different parts of the stomach. The combining form for stomach is gastro. There is no combining form stomacho. That's not a medical term. I don't actually know where stomach came from. It was probably a more recent name. Gastro would be the Greek or Latin term. I can't remember which. So some examples of its use, gastric juice, gastritis, which would be inflammation of the stomach, or gastroesophageal reflux disease, which we just usually abbreviate as GERD, which is what happens when you have a disease where the juices from the stomach reflux or move backwards from the stomach to the esophagus gastroesophageal. The stuff in the stomach is technically, we don't call it food anymore. At that point, we call it chyme. So it's the mixture of your food with all of your gastric juices. And essentially, it's what vomit is. When you vomit, um, it's a great sort of example of how you can really see the contents of your stomach and how they're really very only partially digested. When you vomit, you can often tell like what you last had to eat because there's still food particles in there. So chyme is really not well digested yet at all. After the stomach, that chyme then moves into the small intestine. And the small intestine is divided into three parts because it's actually not small at all. It's something like 
20 or 25 feet in an average person. If you were to cut your intestines open and pull them out, they'd be like three times as long as you are. Four times, five times, something like that. So the first part is um, the shortest part. Um, this little C, this pink section here that looks like a C, that is the duodenum, or you could pronounce it duodenum, either one. And the we'll talk about what's important. So the important thing about the duodenum is that it is connected to the accessory organs. It's connected to the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas. So basically the duodenum is where a bunch of other stuff from other organs gets squirted into the intestines. That's me squirting something. And then this green section here is the jejunum, the middle section. And then the blue section here is the ileum. And basically more and more digestion, like a lot of digestion occurs in the first half, in the duodenum and the jejunum. And then in the ileum, digestion continues, but at this point we're doing a lot of absorption. We're absorbing these nutrients that have been broken down small enough that now they can be taken up into the blood and taken around the body. So the order of the intestines, small intestine, <clears throat> duodenum, jejunum, ileum. Of course, I've got to give you some spelling tips. There are actually two ileums in the body. There's ileum with an E, which is the last part of the small intestine. And there's ileum with an I, which is the large bone in your hip. So my mnemonic to remember which is which is that ileum with an E is the enteric ileum enteric or entero is a combining form that means intestines and ileum with an i hip is spelled with an i so ileum with an i is part of the hip and it seems like a small thing um, a small smell spelling difference but if you were charting somebody in somebody's medical record and you put the wrong ileum you'd be referring to a completely wrong body part Hopefully there would be context clues to reveal your error, but otherwise you wouldn't want like the patient getting surgery on their hip bone when they're supposed to be getting it on their small intestine or whatnot. So, so it is a, an important distinction between spelling. Even if you were just like had a computer program and you could pick from a drop down menu, you do need to know the difference between the two. All right, so remember the small intestine is really important for absorption, absorbing nutrients that have been um, systematically broken down. And so the inside of the small intestine, if you, if you look at it, it's got all these little ridges and folds. And if you were to zoom in on those ridges and folds, you see that they are covered. So these are the ridges and folds and if you look at them they're they're covered in little ridges and folds these little finger-like extensions that are called villi and if you zoom in on one of these little fingers these little villi you'll see that it's actually covered in cells and the cells that line it are covered in these tiny little finger-like extensions that are called microvilli because they're microscopic so the purpose of all these folds and villi and microvilli is to increase the surface area of the intestine because things are absorbed across surfaces. So the more surface area there is, the more absorption you get. And in a lot of inflammatory diseases that cause inflammation in the intestines, they cause erosion of these villi, which disrupts the ability of the intestines to absorb and people can become sort of malnourished because their intestines are too inflamed. They don't have enough surface area to absorb their nutrients. So this inner tube, I guess, of the intestines where stuff flows through is called the lumen. I like to think of the lumen as like, you know, any organ that's like a straw shaped, that's a hollow tube that stuff flows through has a lumen, that hollow place that, that fluid flows through is called the lumen. So your blood vessels have a lumen as well. So lumen is, is just a medical term to know. So after food has been digested and absorbed in 
uh, and, and as much of it can be absorbed in the small intestine, you still have some leftovers. There's still stuff that wasn't digested and couldn't be absorbed. And so that we need to get rid of. And so that gets funneled into the large intestine. And the large intestine is, since it's fairly large, it's a long tube and sort of arranged in a square shape. Um, we also call the large intestine the colon. Um, parts, we'll talk about parts of cecum as a specific part of the large intestine. So ceco is a combining form that's associated with the large intestine. The rectum and the anus are the last parts of the large intestine. So all of these are combining forms that pertain to parts of the large intestine. The large intestine is also a sort of a storage tank. So the stomach is the storage tank for the raw materials and the large intestine is the storage tank for the waste products. And so it also needs to have the ability to expand a little when full. And so it has these little puckered pouches that you'll see in the picture on the next slide. And those are called hostra. The hostra are these sort of puckered pouches. So these little sort of puckered pouches here on the large intestine. So we can see that the small intestine, the ileum, the last section, fuses with the um, large intestine here. This part of the large intestine where the small intestine and large intestine meet is called the cecum. And hanging off of the cecum, this little wormy looking thing, is the appendix. In fact, the formal name is the vermiform appendix. Vermiform means looks like a worm because uh, that's what it looks like. Um, and it is uh, doesn't have any role in digestion, um, but and a lot of people think that the appendix is like a vestigial or part of our bodies that is not important, and that's why so many people can have it removed. But it's actually thought to play an important role in the immune system of the intestines. You have a lot of bacteria that live in your intestines, and there's a lot of ways that, and they're actually really important um, for digestion, but also for the immune system. Um, and the appendix keeps sort of like seed populations. So if you take antibiotics and you kill off a bunch of your, your good microbes in your gut, um, when you stop taking the antibiotics, there's sort of a protected um, seed population in the appendix that will repopulate the intestines. So the appendix doesn't not have a role, but it's definitely not a vital organ, and it can become infected and inflamed, and that's when people need to have it removed to have an appendectomy. All right, getting off course from the anatomy here. So the colon goes up, and then it goes across, and then it goes down. So we call this the ascending colon, the transverse colon, transverse is across, and then the descending colon. And then it has this S-shaped curve here. That's called the sigmoid colon. Sigma, it's like the Greek letter S, so sigmoid. And then this part here is the rectum, this short part at the end, and then this opening here really is the anus. And there are sphincters in the anus that keep, stay closed and open up when you are ready to defecate and let the poop out all of that waste. So all of the intestines are stored or housed in the, in the abdomen, in that abdominopelvic cavity. And the abdominopelvic cavity is held together um, by a membrane called the peritoneum. So that cavity is actually lined by a membrane, and I have some dead mice pictures coming up that are just really good illustrations of the peritoneum. So in the one here, the pink one, you can see really clearly this membrane, this sort of, this is not the skin. The skin and fur have been pulled back. This membrane here holding all the organs in is actually the peritoneum. All right, and the one on the left, this mouse happens to have a more transparent peritoneum, so you can really see here's the ribs, and that brown thing is the liver, and the green uh, ropes there are the small intestine and the large intestine, some of which have poop in it, which probably gives it that color. And so that's what the peritoneum is. 
it's a lining and it produces fluid so it keeps the organs all like lubricated so they don't stick together um, so those are all the organs of the gastrointestinal system that food passes through um, that act, that food actually passes through there's also a couple of organs that play an important role in digestion but food doesn't physically pass through them so we call them accessory organs because they're accessories like they go with the outfit but they're not part of the outfit um, that's my stupid explanation of accessories so the first one is the liver and the liver's important role in the gastrointestinal system is it produces bile and this um, these branches of green here are the biliary vessels or the biliary tree because they 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 make bile which is a chemical that then drains into the next accessory organ the gallbladder which I'll talk about on the next slide. But the combining form you should know for liver is hepato. Hopefully you know that from chapter one already. So some words that use this combining form, hepatocytes, site means cell. So hepatocytes are liver cells. Hepatitis, inflammation of the liver. Hepatomegaly, enlargement of the liver, okay? So hepato is liver and Bilio is a combining form for bile, but another combining form for bile is cola, which is why the gallbladder, whose purpose is really to store bile, the combining form for the gallbladder is cholecysto. It literally means the bile bladder. Uh, it's a sac that holds fluid, and the fluid it holds is bile. So it's a big one, it's a big mouthful, cholecysto, and so are some of these words that use it. So a cholecystectomy would be the actual medical term for gallbladder removal. And cholecystokinin is actually a hormone that's secreted by the duodenum of the small intestine, because as you can see here, there's a duct leading from the gallbladder down here to this duodenum of the small intestine. It squirts bile into the small intestine. So bile really helps us break down fat and fatty foods. So when you eat something that has a lot of fat, when the fat hits the duodenum, it stimulates the production of cholecystokinin, which is a substance that um, influences the movement of the gallbladder, basically. It triggers the squirting of the gallbladder of bile into the from the gallbladder into the duodenum um, bile is what we call an emulsifier it helps to break up big flat fat clumps into smaller fat clumps which makes them easier to digest because fat tends to clump together um, it's not water soluble and the rest of the gastric juice is and so it's easier to digest if we can kind of break it up and dissolve it more into the rest of the of the chyme, if you will. And then the third accessory organ is the pancreas. And it has a duh combining form, pancreato, means pancreas. So you might have pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer pertaining to the pancreas. And it's this fatty looking yellow organ back here. And you can see it also has a duct that extends throughout the pancreas and it fuses with the duodenum. The pancreas makes a lot of digestive enzymes that it squirts into the duodenum to help with digestion. People who have pancreatitis or who um, have a um, pancreatic disease, oftentimes one of the drugs they, one of the medicines they have to take is they have to take basically an enzyme pill of digestive enzymes so that they can digest their food normally in absence of those those enzymes that are being produced normally by the pancreas. Um, so just a tad bit of physiology, some words we already talked about, but I'm just going to reinforce them. Digestion, there are sort of two forms of digestion. Mechanical digestion is like a very physical action. So things like chewing 
All right, even peristalsis, like when the stomach does peristalsis, it kind of like massages the food in your stomach. So that helps to physically break it, break it apart. Um, but most digestion is chemical digestion. So things like bile and stomach acid and enzymes are all chemicals involved in digestion. Um, some of the things that happen mechanically in the mouth, mastication, which is the fancy word for chewing, deglutition, which is the fancy word for swallowing, and then peristalsis, those special types of muscle contractions that kind of like, think of like a snake or something. They push food in one direction, so they keep everything flowing in one direction. Um, and I already mentioned some of these chemicals that are used in chemical digestion. Some of the enzymes that are involved in digestion Amylase is involved in breaking down carbohydrates. Amylose and amylopectin are different types of starches. So amylo means carbohydrate or starch. So amylase is an enzyme that digests starches, carbohydrates. Um, pepsin is an enzyme found in the stomach and it breaks peptide bonds, which are part of proteins. So it digests proteins. And then lipase is an enzyme that digests lipids, which are fats. So uh, another one is lactase, which is an enzyme that's actually made by your jejunum um, to break down lactose, which is milk sugar. So people who are lactose intolerant um, don't make lactase, or they don't make enough lactase to keep up with their lactose consumption. And then the lactose doesn't get broken down, it stays in the intestines and it goes all the way to the large intestine where it draws in water and bacteria feed on it. And so you get gassy and you get diarrhea um, if you lack lactase and are lactose intolerant. So notice this suffix ace, amylase, lipase, lactase, that suffix ace means enzyme, it indicates an enzyme. Most enzymes end in the suffix ace. Another, so digestion is the first important function of the GI tract, and then the other important functions are absorption and elimination. So remember, absorption is done mostly by the small intestine. Nutrients, like broken down nutrients, are absorbed across the small intestine, like, through this, the cell lining of the small intestine into the blood vessels. And the blood carries all those absorbed nutrients straight to the liver. And then the liver decides where to send them all. Um, and uh, elimination is the process of getting rid of waste. We call that waste, you know, colloquially I call it poop, um, but the more technical terms are stool or feces. And the tech, more technical terms for pooping are having a bowel movement or defecation. Defecation literally means to like get rid of feces, a process of getting rid of feces. Um, a bowel movement is sometimes abbreviated BM, like you might ask if you know, has your patient had a BM yet? Um, side story about that i grew up in atlanta and one of the like fast food chains there is called boston market which i loved they sell like rotisserie chicken and turkey and like all the like good sides like thanksgiving sides and um so i used to go there a lot as a kid and my dad would call it bm and he'd be like who wants to go to bm for dinner and i was like dad that's gross it sounds like you're talking about a bowel movement i don't want to think about poop when i'm thinking about dinner so don't call boston market bm this is just a handy dandy slide from your textbook um, that goes through the order of all the different parts of the gastrointestinal system, starting in the mouth, which we call the oral cavity. You swallow food, it goes past the throat, the pharynx, down the esophagus, the food tube, I like to call it, into the stomach, then from the stomach into the small intestine, and the three parts of the small intestine in order are the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And remember those accessory organs, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas are all connected to the duodenum. 
and squirt their good stuff into the duodenum so that digestion and absorption can really happen in here. And then anything that doesn't get digested and absorbed goes into the large intestine. And the parts of the large intestine in order are the cecum. So if I were to sort of draw it, we have the cecum, the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, and anus there. All right, so that is a, a good thing to know, that order. That could be a question on a test, like what is the correct order that food moves through the gastrointestinal system? Um, or where does food go after the cecum? Um, that kind of thing. All right, so the second half of the chapter is all about diseases and conditions affecting the gastrointestinal system. So we'll start with ones that are diseases of eating. And I did a little word surgery on some of these to help you get used to kind of seeing that. Um, you're doing it in your homework already. So the first one is anorexia. If we were to define this, we would say that ia, that suffix means a condition of, where did my mouse go? A condition of, and the prefix an is without or not, and orexo means appetite. So it's a condition without appetite. And a lot of people um, think of anorexia as simply the condition anorexia nervosa, which is actually a mental illness where people refuse to eat um, and ha usually is associated with uh, distorted body image and really an obsession. It's a type of like almost obsessive compulsive disorder. But anorexia can also be a symptom. Um, a loss of appetite can just be a symptom of aging or a side effect of something like chemotherapy um, or of other diseases, like even somebody with a, an appendicitis might experience a lack of appetite. So anorexia is not just an eating disorder, a mental eating disorder, it is, or a psychological condition, it's also actually like a symptom of just, you know, losing your appetite. Dysphagia, a condition of difficult or painful eating or swallowing. Phago is eating or swallowing. So this can happen if you have a sore throat even, you might have dysphagia, or if you have throat cancer, you might experience dysphagia. Um, lots of things can cause difficulty. Also different um, nervous system issues. If you have some kind of nerve issue with swallowing, um, difficulty eating. And polyphagia is, is overeating, so eating too much. Poly is many. Some conditions of the mouth and lips. Chylo is a combining form that means lips. So chylitis is inflammation of the lips. We see this a lot, I experience it at least anyway, in the winter time when your lips become very chapped and may start to crack a little bit. All right, that's chylitis. Sialolithiasis. Iasis is a condition of. Sialo means salivary glands. And litho, this is a new one for you, is stone. So it's a salivary stone, a condition of saliva stones. So just like people get kidney stones, you can also get sal salivary stones, where it's basically like a little precipitate, salt crystal that precipitates from the saliva, from the salivary gland, and then it has to be expelled so it moves through the salivary ducts, and it's super, super painful. They're much less common than um, kidney stones, but they can happen. So the moral story is to keep yourself well hydrated to prevent these stones or salt precipitates from forming. And stomatitis, inflammation of the mouth. Stoma is the mouth. And um, glossitis, more specifically, is inflammation of the tongue. So glossitis is your tongue is in your mouth. So it's a form of stomatitis, but more specifically when the tongue is inflamed. And lots of things can cause inflammation of the tongue. I mean, if you burn your tongue, from drinking like hot coffee, that's one thing. But also there's a lot of um, nutrient deficiencies that actually cause your tongue to swell. It's one of the symptoms or signs. 
Um, some other ones, now we're getting down into the esophagus, conditions of the esophagus and stomach. Uh, dyspepsia is a word that means a condition of abnormal or painful digestion. So that's sort of just like the medical term for indigestion. You know, after you eat and you just have like a stomach ache, that is dyspepsia. Gastroenteritis is an inf it's inflammation that's caused by an infection usually of the stomach and intestines. So when you have a stomach bug, what you actually have is gastroenteritis. Heartburn is caused by acid moving from the stomach up into the esophagus. Because remember, the stomach has that protective mucus lining that protects it from um, being damaged by all that, that nasty gastric juice. But the esophagus doesn't have that protective lining. And so if that sphincter opens up and food moves up or um, gastric juice moves up from the stomach into the esophagus, it literally burns the esophagus. It causes chemical burns and it feels like a burning sensation. Um, a lot of people experience it in their chest near their heart because that's where the stomach and the esophagus connect is right near the heart and so it's called heartburn but I know I personally experience it during pregnancy and and for me it's like more up in my throat like I almost feel like I'm gonna throw up some like lava or like I'm breathing acid it, it's higher up so um, another term for it is pyrosis which literally means a condition of fire, pyro, like a pyromaniac likes to play with fire. Um, again, having to do with that burning sensation. So people who experience it infrequently, then we refer to it as sort of heartburn. But if you have it chronically, like you're experiencing it multiple times a day, that is called gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. So it's such a mouthful, it's very common that we abbreviate that. And um, the cause of GERD, most likely cause of GERD, is a weakening of that sphincter. So if the sphincter is just like not closing properly and is always kind of staying open, then you get more chronic heartburn. So that's what GERD is, it's more like chronic heartburn. Um, peptic ulcer disease is also something that's caused by stomach acid and this happens in the stomach usually if there's something that causes that protective mucous membrane to erode and for a long time doctors did not know what caused peptic ulcers they knew this is a picture of a peptic ulcer so all these folds here are the rugi of the stomach but this crater here is just a big ulcer, a big lesion where acid and enzymes have have eroded away part of the stomach lining and it's very painful. Um, it can increase your risk of stomach cancer and for a long time doctors didn't know what caused it or how to treat it and they just tell people go home and rest and don't eat spicy foods and try not to stress out and hopefully it'll go away and here's some painkillers and some antacids to take. Um, and sometimes that helped and it went away or kept it under control. But it wasn't until the 1980s, actually, that we learned that stomach ulcers are largely due to a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. And Helicobacter pylori happens to like to munch away at the mucus in the stomach lining. So it doesn't hurt your stomach per se, eating the mucus is just it's just a secretion, but that mucus, remember, has an important protective role. And so without that protection, with the helicobacter eating away your protection, then your gastric juice actually starts to damage parts of the, the stomach. So if you have peptic ulcer, um, they will still give you antacids to help neutralize the stomach acid sort of cool everything off. Antacids are also given for heartburn and GERD, right? But if you have pelvic ulcer disease, they're also going to give you antibiotics. Antibiotics are very effective at treating ulcers. They get rid of those bacteria, then your mucus, your protective mucus is restored and the ulcer can heal. 
other diseases of the esophagus or conditions of the esophagus and stomach, nausea and vomiting, often abbreviated, so that's an abbreviation you should know, as NNV on, a, on like a medical record or on a chart. Uh, the medical term for vomiting is actually emesis. And so um, some words that have emesis in it, hematemesis is vomiting blood, which might happen if you have an, a bleeding ulcer, stomach ulcer, and hyperemesis gravidarum, which is a excessive vomiting during pregnancy. Gravida means pregnancy. So basically like really, really bad morning sickness. It's common for people to feel nausea during the early stages of pregnancy, but sometimes they can't even keep any food down and they become very dehydrated and actually have to be admitted to the hospital because they're just vomiting so much. That would be hyperemesis gravidarum. I thought there was, I have a mouse in my office. I'm in my office right now. And I know there's a mouse in here because I see mouse droppings where I left a bag of cookies the other day and um, my sweater just fell off my chair and hit my foot and I thought it was the mouse, but it wasn't. So sorry for the interruption. <laughs> All right, back to the small intestine, diseases of the small intestine. Um, ileus. Ileus is a condition where there's no peristalsis. So sort of a stopping of intestinal movement. And remember that peristalsis is important for keeping food flowing. So if it stops, then you get like a traffic jam of chyme or stool, and that's not good. Um, one case though where ileus is normal and temporary is after an abdominal operation. So if you have um, a surgery on the intestines, it's it kind of shocks the intestines and they kind of like, you know, freeze for a little while. And then as they recover, they start to move again. And so um, one of the things that doctors check for after abdominal operations is um, for that borborygmus sound, the sound that peristalsis has restarted and that the postoperative ileus has gone away. They also look for bowel movements to indicate that the postoperative ileus has gone away, but it's normal after operations. Um, but if you have it more chronically, it can cause like irritable bowel syndrome. Intussusception is a specific condition that's pictured here. All right, it's described like the words they use to describe it is a telescoping of the intestines because the intestines are sort of getting sucked in on itself, kind of like a telescope, you know, like you pull it out and then you collapse it in on itself. So that's what it means by a telescoping of the, in, in, of the intestines. I think of it as like part of the intestine getting sucked into itself. And it can cause blockages. Um, sometimes the intussusception can be simply like the, a little massage um, or manipulation of the intestines can resolve it. But sometimes these um, uh, membranes, the linings actually fuse together and become stuck. And so then this whole section has to be cut out and stitched back together. Um, but it can cause a dangerous and deadly blockage in the intestines if it's not fixed. Same thing with volvulus. Volvulus is also known as malrotation of the intestines. So the, remember the intestines are, the small intestine is like 25 feet long. So that's a lot of intestine just like packed into your ab abdomen and sometimes it can become twisted and this condition is more common in certain um, like demographics and certain countries possibly related to certain dietary differences not clear um, but it's a twisting of the intestines and again sometimes the doctor can go in and simply untwist it and it's fine but what's really bad if is if, if it gets twisted so tight that then that part of the blood flow to that little twist or fold in the intestines is cut off and, and it starts to die, it starts turning black basically. And that's really dangerous. Um, so a lot of times, again, this part has to be cut out and the intestines have to be fused together. So both of these are usually emergency situations that need to be treated 
quickly before they result in deadly blockages. Other diseases of the, now for some diseases of the large intestine, of the colon, remember hanging off the cecum is the appendix, and the appendix can become inflamed or infected, and that's called appendicitis. And the danger of appendicitis is that the appendix can then rupture and burst. And if it does that, then it basically releases tons of bacteria into your abdominal pelvic space, into the peritoneal cavity. And then that can cause sepsis and deadly infections. So usually doctors want to remove it while it's inflamed and before it bursts. Now that in the advent of surgery and antibiotics, you can even have a burst appendix and survive it. But back in the day before antibiotics existed, appendicitis was like a major cause of death that doctors just didn't know how to treat. Um, and But now it's very treatable. Um, colon cancer, cancer of the large intestine. Dysentery is abnormal or painful enterics, intestines. This is basically a bacterial infection that causes bloody diarrhea. Um, irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, is a sort of idiopathic disease. It's not really known what causes it. It's basically people who experience chronic dyspepsia and constipation and diarrhea, and they don't really know what is causing it. Um, they call it irritable bowel syndrome. Diverticulosis is pictured here, and so is polyposis. So here's a segment of the large intestine. And this part here, this is like one of those hostra pouches has been stretched out, and like some bacteria and food has gotten clogged in there, and it becomes inflamed. So diverticulitis is a really painful condition of inflammation of the large intestine. And sometimes they can treat it with some antibiotics and maybe some dietary changes, but sometimes the really inflamed sections have to be surgically removed. Um, and a polyp is a growth into the lumen of the large intestine, and they can be benign or they can be cancerous. And so when you get a colonoscopy and they run a camera up through your colon, they're looking for those polyps, any potential cancerous polyps. And if they find one, they might snip it off, take it to a lab and check it out to see if it is cancerous or not. Some autoimmune diseases of the intestines. So autoimmune diseases are technically diseases of the immune system, but they are diseases where the immune system attacks parts of the body. And so this is an autoimmune disease that affects the gastrointestinal system, um, celiac disease, and inflammatory bowel diseases are the two big ones. So celiac disease is kind of like an allergy to gluten. What happens is, and this is my silly mnemonic if you've ever seen the movie Zoolander, which I should probably rewatch because it's a great movie and I haven't seen it in a while. So anyway, in Zoolander, um, Ben Stiller plays this supermodel who's like really stupid and um, and Will Ferrell plays the villainous character and he's like a fashion designer and he wants to kill the what prime minister of Malaysia because um, the prime minister of Malaysia wants to shut down all the like child factories that Will Ferrell's villainous character uses to make all his clothes. So he wants to kill this guy, but he needs somebody else to be the fall guy. And so he tries to brainwash Zoolander, Ben Stiller's character, into becoming like this total assassin. And so he trains him with like a song and every time this, like he hypnotizes him. And so every time the song plays, he like goes into total assassin mode. All right, you're like, what does this have to do with celiac disease? So in celiac disease, your immune system is like Zoolander. Like it's like, it's fine normally, but then when it's exposed to gluten, gluten is like that hypnotic trigger that triggers the immune system to go into like super assassin mode and it tries to kill your small intestine. 
And so the good news about celiac disease is that it does have a trigger. That trigger is gluten. And so you can avoid the disease simply by avoiding gluten in the diet. But gluten's in a lot of things. It's in a lot of grains that we eat. Um, but gluten-free diets have become more trendy. So there's, it's really a lot more accessible now, diets that are gluten-free. Um, so people with celiac disease can really avoid developing the disease by avoiding that dietary component. Inflammatory bowel diseases are not well understood. We still don't know what triggers them or causes the immune system to go berserk and start attacking the intestines. But the two main types are Crohn's disease, which largely affects the small intestine, and ulcerative colitis, colitis meaning inflammation of the colon, it largely affects the large intestine. Um, and both of these are just due to the immune system attacking the intestines. And you can see what a mess um, it turns the intestines in, into. Sorry. Um, it can erode the lining of the intestines. It can also cause uh, the lining to thicken, which can cause obstructions and then stuff can't flow. Um, it can cause ulcers, just like stomach ulcers, but these are intestinal ulcers. So just the, all the inflammation can really do a lot of damage. And so there's different drug therapies. There's also surgical therapy to just remove the inflamed section um, for these diseases, but there's no cure for them because we still don't really understand some of these autoimmune conditions and why the immune system it insists on attacking it, the body. Now for the last part of the small of the large intestine, the rectum and the anus, you can develop hemorrhoids, sometimes known as piles, though I, I think that's like an like a grandma term for them, but um, hemorrhoids, literally they they resemble blood bleeding, I guess is what that means. But what hemorrhoids are is they're swollen veins in the area of the rectum and the anus and um, they can become inflamed and be very painful or they can like rupture and bleed um, and lead to sort of like bloody stools and just they can be just uncomfortable. Proctitis inflammation of the rectum. Procto and recto are combining forms that have the same meaning. They're synonyms. And recto seal. Seal is a new suffix that will come back. We'll see it again. It means a, a hernia, a type of hernia. So when the rectum herniates or busts through the wall of the vagina, um, that's called a recto seal. And this happens. Um, can happen after labor. So labor can really wreck or um, damage the wall of the vagina and lead to hemorrhaging of either the rectum or the bladder into the vaginal canal. And the surgery to fix that is basically repairing that the wall of the vagina so those other organs stay out and stay in their own lanes. Some conditions that have to do with the actual process of defecating, of forming feces and getting rid of feces. Constipation, diarrhea. So, side story again, when I was in college, I took a sign language class and it was a great class. It was so much fun. It was like, take, it was like playing a game of charades for two hours. The teacher would just, you know, stand up front and like act things out like a mime and then show us the sign for it. But then at the end of class, he'd leave 15 minutes for questions. Like, what words do you want to know in sign language? Of course, we're a bunch of, you know, teenage college students. So I'm sure somebody raised their hand and said, how do you say shit? And so he said, this is how, how you say it. It's like poop coming out of the anus. So that's poop. All right. And then he also shared with us, because we had just learned the term for water that day, which is a W on the chin. So he said, this is diarrhea. So this is poop and this is diarrhea. And so I can only assume that constipation would be something like this, where the poop is stuck. So that's what constipation is. So diarrhea is watery stool and constipation is stool that is stuck and won't come out, usually because it's, it's hard, it's not watery enough. Flatulence is a fancy word for gas or farting. Um, hematochesia, 
condition of blood in the stool. Kizo means stool or feces. Um, so dysentery could cause hematochesia. Hemorrhoids can even cause hematochesia. Cancer can cause hematochesia. So there's like lots of things that can result in blood in the stool. And you can have fresh blood, which is red and very obvious. Or if you have blood, if you have like um, an ulcer, like a stomach ulcer, and it's bleeding, you might have blood in your stool, but by the time, you know, it reaches the large intestine, that blood is kind of a brown color, so you can't really see it. It's not as obvious in the stool, but you can, you can test for it and find it that way. Incontinence is an inability to control your release of feces or urine. Um, so a loss of control maybe of the sphincters in the anus or could be just due to really watery stools that are hard to, to hold in. Steatorrhea is, so rhea is a flow, diarrhea flow, um, and steatorrhea, steato means fatty. So steatorrhea is like fatty diarrhea, and it's very common if people have their gallbladder removed, because the gallbladder, remember, squirts bile, into the small intestine, which helps you digest fats. So if you don't have a gallbladder, and you can't squirt that bile in, then you don't digest fats very well, and the fats end up coming out as waste. And fats are greasy and oily, and so it's like a greasy, oily type of diarrhea. Um, some different types of hernias. So now we're talking, we're getting sort of a, away from the gas. We've finished all the organs of the gastrointestinal system. Now we're talking about some sort of abdominal conditions and some conditions of the accessory organs. So the abdominal wall, you've got the peritoneum and then you've got the muscles um, of the abdomen. All right, so the peritoneum, if there's a tear in the muscle, of the abdomen, um, then what can happen is a piece of your of that long tube of intestine can sort of peep out through that tear in the muscle, and that is called a hernia. And hernias have different levels of sort of severity. Um, if it's a sliding hernia, it's one that like sticks out, and you can like poke at it and push it back in. Uh, but then the next day it's sticking out again and you just slide it back in and it's, you know, annoying, but it's something that does need to be fixed. But if you have a sliding hernia, the surgeon might schedule your surgery, you know, for a couple of weeks out. It's not an emergency. It's something that needs fixing, but they can schedule it around what's convenient for you and them. Um, a more serious type of hernia is one where the intestine is stuck in there and maybe even being pinched so hard that the blood flow is being lost. Those are much more dangerous. That is called an incarcerated, is a stuck one, and a string, strangulated hernia is one that's cutting off blood flow. And that is an emergent situation. So you don't want your part, part of your intestine to die and to start necrosing and rotting inside you. So if you, if you present with a strangulated hernia, you're going straight to the OR for surgery. There's no, no scheduling it a week or two out. Another type of hernia, a congenital hernia, is this one here. So it's one that you can be born with. And this one is called an umbilical hernia, or another name for it is an umphalocele. Umbilico and umphalo both mean navel or belly button. And in this case, when the fetus is developing and the abdominal wall is forming, part of the intestines are not tucked in. And so they develop outside of the, so they basically are sticking out of the belly button. And this can oftentimes be spotted on a fetal ultrasound. And so then they might choose to deliver the baby via C-section because a vaginal birth might, you know, pop or tear or damage the intestines here. So they want to be able to carefully remove the baby. And then they can do surgery, to hernia surgery, basically, to tuck those intestines back in. Um, so it's something that's really important to find on an ultrasound because that will determine how to best safely deliver the baby 
so that the surgery can be performed. Um, and as long as it's diagnosed, it's usually very treatable, um, but still very can be very scary to experience. Diseases of the liver, one of the accessory organs of the gastrointestinal system. system. When the liver is diseased, it often produces this excess fluid called ascites, which fill the abdominal, um, the abdominal cavity and cause it to sort of swell. And sometimes that ascites needs to be removed and they'll take a syringe and stick the syringe in the abdomen and just withdraw, pull off that ascites fluid and squirt it out, I don't know, down the sink or something. And that's called an abdominocentesis. Centesis is a new prefix in this chapter. It means to, the definition in the textbook is it, it means to puncture, but really more specifically, it means to puncture and withdraw fluid. Another one that people are familiar with is an amniocentesis for um, doing tests during pregnancy where you withdraw some amniotic fluid. Cirrhosis is a um, chronic condition of the liver where over years and years of abuse, um, the liver basically becomes very scarred. So this is a healthy liver. This liver here is a fatty liver. It's why it looks kind of yellowish. It's not functioning properly when it's full of fat. And this here on the right is a cirrhotic liver that has cirrhosis. So it looks all like, um, I don't know, wrinkly and rough and not so smooth and fresh. And that's just basically scar tissue. Basically your liver is, is full of scar tissue from um, undergoing constant damage and repair. So a common cause of cirrhosis is alcohol abuse, chronic al alcohol abuse. Hepatitis is inflammation of the liver, which often is due to um, a bacterial or viral infection, viral hepatitis, hepatitis viruses. Um, hepatomegaly would be an enlargement or swelling of the liver. Um, and there's a lot of things that can cause that. Jaundice is a yellowing of the skin and eyes that happens as a symptom of liver disease. One of the jobs of the liver that has nothing to do with the gastrointestinal system is that it helps to break down old blood cells, red blood cells, it helps to break down old hemoglobin and a protein called bilirubin. So bilirubin is this yellow, it's, it's bile colored bilirubin. It's like a lime green, greenish yellow color. So if the liver is unable to break it down, it builds up in the blood and it actually like leads to discoloration of your skin. That, that yellowish color, jaundice, is a classic sign of liver disease. Some diseases of the gallbladder, remember gallbladder's combining form is cholecysto. So you could have cholecystitis, inflammation of the gallbladder. There's also such a thing as gallstones. That's what we call them colloquially, but the medical term for it is cholelithiasis, um, a condition of stones, of bile stones. Um, and uh, you can have the whole gallbladder removed, which would be a cholecystectomy, or you might have just the gallstones removed and the gallbladder repaired, and that's a cholodogolithotomy, where the stones are, where there's an incision made to remove the stones. Some diagnostic procedures that can be used to identify and diagnose diseases of the gastrointestinal system, many of which are radiologic procedures. So you could have a CAT scan or a CT scan, which stands for computerized axial tomography, which is basically like serial x-rays, where you get x-rays of multiple sections throughout the body, and then a computer can assemble them into a three-dimensional picture, or you can look at them as two-dimensional sections. You could do an ultrasound using sonography or sound waves to visualize organs in the abdomen, just like you can use them to visualize a fetus. Um, and there's also magnetic resonance imaging, uh, MRI, which is uses magnets, not x-rays, but they form similar types of images as CAT scans, 
um, except they are not rate they're not radioactive um, like x-rays are a cholangiography cholangio chola is bile angio is a vessel so this is looking at the bile ducts it's a recording of the bile ducts a lot of times what they'll do is they'll inject a dye and then look for the um, the flow They'll, they'll track the dye and see is there a blockage in the bile duct that's causing some disease. So diseases can be treated through different medical and surgical procedures. Put my face up here. Um, a term to know that's going to come back to you is something called ana resection and anastomosis. So I talked about a lot of conditions where it might be treated by cutting out a diseased piece of the intestine and then fusing those ends back together. You have 25 feet of small intestine, you can afford to have some pieces removed and then stitched back together. So the removal is called resection. You're cutting a piece out and the sewing back together is the anastomosis. So an anastomosis is to form a few to fuse two ends of a tube together. A gastroplasty is a procedure to reshape the stomach. Plasty means reshape. Plasto means shape. Um, so uh, there's lots of different types of gastroplasty. Some common, a lot of them are procedures to reduce the size of the stomach in order to um, serve as a weight management control. So there's gastric banding. Um, there's gastric stapling and there's gastric bypass where they cut out most of the stomach and sew it to the small intestine. So basically food goes almost immediately from the esophagus into the small intestine. They're, they leave a very small piece of stomach. Um, and that's to help you feel basically all the, the idea or theory behind those is your stomach fills up faster because it's smaller so you feel full you stop eating and you eat less and so it helps in weight control in that way um, there's also several procedures to form a stomy or an ostomy which is a surgically created opening and this can happen in um, people who have col colon cancer maybe have to have a part of their colon removed like if they have their whole rectum removed then there's no way for them to get stool from the colon out to the anus, out of the anus. So they basically um, make a stomy, a stoma, a hole, and, um, and poop basically comes out into this bag, this colostomy bag. It collects in the bag and then you empty the bag. So it's, a, it's an opening. Sometimes these ostomy procedures are temporary, maybe until the intestines heal properly but sometimes they are permanent and you have an ostomy bag for decades. So you can have a colostomy, which is an ostomy somewhere in the colon. You can have a ileostomy in the ileum of the small intestine or a jejunostomy. And those might be in people who have maybe have Crohn's disease and had so much inflammation they had to have significant chunks of their intestines removed, I don't know. Um, a gastrostomy in the stomach is not used for waste, but is used for feeding. So in that, in the case of a colostomy, stuff is coming out of the bag. But in the case of a gastrostomy, the opening is for like a feeding tube to go directly into the stomach for someone who maybe can't swallow um, or has esophageal camp, had part of their esophagus removed. And so they have to get food directly into their stomach. Um, some other things that have to do with the abdomen, a laparotomy. Lapero is abdomen. It's a combining form that means abdomen. And otomy or tomy is to make an incision. So a laparotomy is really the start of any abdominal surgery. You make an incision into the abdomen. Um, there are sometimes diseases in the abdomen that you just you can't see and diagnose well with those different diagnostic tools like x-rays or 
or MRIs. And so sometimes doctors just have to go in. They call that an exploratory laparotomy. We're going to open you up. We're going to see what the problem is. And then if we can find it, we'll remove it. But, but they kind of go in blind a little bit. They're not really sure what they're going to find. And they're going in to see what they can find. Um, laparoscopic surgeries use a scope like a little camera so they make small incisions like two or three small incisions and one incision goes the camera and the other incision goes the tools and then they can do the surgery inside the abdomen without cutting a big scar into the abdomen and it, it reduces recovery time um, and usually is it if it's uh for a lot of organs like um the gallbladder, for example, is a small organ. It can be removed through a small hole. And a lot of gallbladder removals or cholecystectomies are per performed laparoscopically through these small incisions using a little camera to see what you're doing inside. A biopsy is taking a piece of live tissue and looking at it under the microscope. So you send it down to the lab and they process it, put it on micro microscope slides, and then the pathologist looks at it to determine whether the cells are normal or abnormal, like cancerous. <clears throat> so if you had polyposis, if you had polyps in your colon, they might do a biopsy to see if they're cancerous. A nasogastric tube, which is commonly just called an NG tube, is pictured here, and it's a tube that goes through the nose and then down the nasopharynx. So the nasal passages actually connect with the throat, which is why you can like be eating spaghetti and then sneeze and the spaghetti comes out of your nose, okay? Because the throat, the mouth, and the nose are actually connected through the pharynx. So the, the tube goes down the throat and down the esophagus into the stomach, and it's a feeding tube. It's a way to um, feed a patient who can't swallow and can't eat or maybe is uh, like unconscious so they can't eat. There's also very various endoscopic procedures. So an endo, the prefix endo means within, and scope is to investigate or to examine with like a camera. So these are all procedures that look at your insides with a camera. So some of them are top down, so they feed the endoscope in through your mouth and they can look at your esophagus and your stomach, the superior parts of the gastrointestinal system. Or they can go in through the anus to look at the inferior parts. So the, uh, a colonoscopy goes up through the anus and rectum, um, uses a, an endoscope or a colonoscope to do that. <clears throat> Some other procedures that can be done. If you have diseased organs, sometimes they just have to be removed. Um, and those are all ectomy procedures to surgically remove something. Gastrectomy to remove all or part of the stomach, maybe if you have stomach cancer. Hemorrhoidectomy to cut off hemorrhoids that are particularly bothersome. An appendectomy to remove the appendix if it's inflamed a cholecystectomy to remove the gallbladder, polypectomy to remove a polyp, and then some other ones, a herniorophy, here's a new suffix here, raphi, and notice the spelling RRH, and I forgot to point it out earlier, but um, the word cirrhosis also has that weird spelling, RRH, so RRH is like a a letter pattern to memorize. There's diarrhea also has RRH as part of its spelling pattern um, that students trip up on on spelling. So something to make a mental note of. So raffi, that suffix raffi or orophy, means a procedure of suturing, of stitching together. So a hernia, remember, is a tear in the abdominal wall and the intestines stick out through it. So we gotta tuck the intestines back in and then sew that hole closed. So it's a herniorophy, you're stitching the hernia back together. And then of course, liver transplantation, any kind of transplant is to um, take an organ from one 
person, a donor, and put it into another person. Um, so a liver transplant, that's what that is. And it can be done in cases of cirrhosis and liver failure. And then the last thing to know is just a handful of drug categories that I think are important and use medical terminology. Antacid, so a lot of these have anti, ant or anti, which means against. So they work against. So antacids are against acid. So they um, neutralize acids. They're usually weak bases because bases neutralize acids. So things like Tums and Rolaids are antacids that you can take and they work immediately. Antibiotics are against living things, specifically microbes like bacteria. So if you have a bacterial infection um, like Helicobacter pylori that's causing you stomach ulcers or salmonella or something that's causing a bad case of gastroenteritis, you might take some antibiotics for that. Uh, an antidiarrheal treats diarrhea, and an antiemetic treats emesis, vomiting. So that's like an anti nausea medication, like Dramamine for motion sickness would be an anti emetic. Uh, I'm not like super familiar with all the different drugs out there, but usually I have some students who can, can throw, rattle off a couple more drugs that are anti-nausea or vomiting medications. And then a laxative is a treatment for constipation. It increases bowel movements and peristalsis, and so it helps to push constipated stools out. Um, they're often taken along with stool softeners to first soften the stool and then increase those bowel movements, the peristalsis, to treat constipation. And that is the end of chapter three lecture. It is a long one, but that's again because the gastrointestinal system has so many parts. So there's so many parts to talk about and so many diseases. It also means there's so many word parts to study in vocabulary. So make sure you're giving yourself plenty of time with that. And I'll see you next for chapter four.